the reading today, Mark 10, uh, 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him, that's Jesus, and said, Teacher, we want you to do something for us if we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They answered him, Allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or to be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We are able, they told him. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those it has been prepared for. When the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and their men of high positions exercise power over them. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's an outline there and uh, the announcements took a lot of time. I'm sorry about that. Uh, But if we have time after the sermon, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask any questions you might have. Uh, Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany uh, due to many circumstances, if you know your history. Uh, It's fair to say there was a fair bit of political skullduggery that built on foundations of resentment that had emerged out of the Great War, the First World War. From afar in international politics, there were many world leaders who regarded Hitler with a high level of approval. After all, the rise of a strong Germany and a strong German leader meant that the world economy would benefit, and it was in the middle of the Great Depression. As Hitler exerted his authority, he consistently and willfully broke international agreements and treaties placed upon Germany. From 1933, he actively rearmed the military against international law and treaty. In 1936, he took back the Rhineland, an area given away so there would be a buffer against the rest of Europe. And in 1938, he reunited Germany and Austria. He was open about what he was on about. He wanted to reunite all the German people and restore them to their glory. As the West watched, and particularly Britain, they decided to follow a policy called appeasement. If we give Germany this, we can avoid war. If we give Germany this, we can avoid war because hanging in the background was the horror of the slaughter of the First World War. In 1938, Hitler made it public that he wanted the region of the Sudetenland, which was a German-speaking region connected to Czechoslovakia. The Prime Minister of Britain at that time was Neville Chamberlain, and in a series of three meetings, he flew to meet Hitler to negotiate. Eventually, after a meeting in Munich, he agreed, and let me tell you, the Czechs weren't asked, he agreed that Hitler could take the Sudetenland. And Hitler said, I'll take nothing else. There is a famous image of Chamberlain landing in Britain, disembarking from his plane, waving the Munich Agreement document and declaring, we have peace in our time. Within six months, Hitler took the rest of Czechoslovakia, invaded Poland, and the Second World War began. I don't think I'm being unfair to Chamberlain to say that he misunderstood Hitler, didn't he? He misunderstood the man, he misunderstood his mission, he misunderstood his plans. The result? It was catastrophic, wasn't it? I think many people do the same with Jesus, don't they? They misunderstand the person, 
They misunderstand the purpose. They misunderstand the plan. And the result? Let me tell you, it's catastrophic. We're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It is such a delight to read it. Uh, Father, as we're told in Psalm 19, it is sweeter than honey, more precious than gold. It reveals your purpose and plan. It reveals your judgment of sin and your wonderful salvation. Father, as we think upon your word, especially this little incident in Mark's biography of Jesus, please apply it to us. Please change us. Please help us to go out to point people to how wonderful Jesus is. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I have point two on the outline. Uh, Mark's biography of Jesus is one uh, a lot of teenage boys go to because it's the shortest and got the most action. 16 chapters doesn't stop. But don't let that fool you into thinking that it's a simplistic biography. Uh, it divides into two parts. Uh, the first part of Mark's biography of Jesus asks one key question. Who's this bloke? Uh, he arrives in the world, as Mark describes it, prepared for by the whole Old Testament. He arrives as a man prepared for by his cousin, John the Baptist. He's baptised and then he goes out and immediately begins his work. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So who's this bloke? Who's this bloke? Well, the rest of the first half of Mark unpacks it unpacks his identity through a whole series of episodes until we reach the climax of this first part in Mark chapter 8. Jesus is walking along with his disciples. He asks them who people think he is. Now, he's not worried about the news headlines or public opinion or popularity. He then drills down further into their answers to ask them who they think he is. And Peter answers in Mark chapter 8, Verse 29, but you, Jesus, asked him again, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, the Christ. It's a massive moment. I identify with these blokes because like them, I can be so dull and bumbling and stumbling when it comes to getting Jesus straight. And they finally seem to have gotten it. This is the king God promised to come and save the world, to gather God's people to roll back sin, to establish God's rule as he intended through his people. If we were there, we'd do a Leighton Hill with a fist pump. They do a high five. And then Jesus steps in in verse 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He was openly talking about this, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. What's going on? They've got it. Jesus seems to have misunderstood it. I mean, how could Jesus get this so wrong? But here we see the fundamental misunderstanding that then drives the second half of Mark's biography. They've worked out who he is. At least they've got a label to put on him. Now they've got to work out what that means for them, for him and for them as they follow him. Now, on the one hand, Peter and the other disciples are fed and fueled by their desire for a saviour who'll kick out the Romans, restore Jerusalem as the capital of a new glorious Jewish nation, bring back the glory days of their nation under King David. At around that time, there are a number of writers who are writing saying now is the time for God to send his promised king to remove the filth from the land and to restore us to our glory, and that is feeding into them. On the other hand, Jesus is very open, isn't he? Isn't that a great line there? Jesus was openly speaking about this. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to reject me. They're going to have a trial. They're going to kill me and I'll rise in three days. It's horrific, isn't it? I don't think they heard that last bit, did they? It's disastrous. It's a complete failure. We've left everything behind to follow a bloke who's dead set on getting himself killed. That's counterintuitive, isn't it? Nothing triumphant about this. Nothing that's going to restore the world. Nothing hopeful about a saviour who's come with the express purpose of getting himself killed. 
Why would you hitch your cart to that horse? Now, immediately after that moment, Jesus' identity is confirmed again. If you've got your Bibles there, you'll see that we have that magnificent moment where Jesus goes up on that hill. There's a lot of stuff that happens on hills in the Bible. Goes up on that hill and he's transfigured. And in words very similar to the words he uttered at his baptism, the Father speaks again. Mark chapter 9, verse 7, A cloud appeared overshadowing them and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved Son. And here's the change. Listen to him. Jesus is God's son. God loves him. God has sent him. God uses words taken straight from the coronation poem recited at the coronation of the kings of God's people from Psalm 2. This is my beloved son. This is the king. And then God gives them a command. What was it? Listen to him. That command wasn't there at the baptism. There's been a change because now they know who he is. Now they've got that identity straight. Now it's about learning what it means to follow him. And at the heart of following Jesus is what? Listen to him. But there's also a pattern established here. It's a pattern that carries through right through. Don't worry, I'll get to today's reading. We'll get there. There's a pattern that carries right through to today's reading. Because three times Jesus talks like this. Mark 8, 33, 9, 31, Mark 10, 33. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to reject me. They're going to kill me. I'll rise in three days. Three times his closest followers go, we're not listening to you because you're not doing what we want. We want greatness and gold and restoration and glory. We want the kingdom of David re-established. We want the Romans kicked out. They don't listen to him. They don't understand him. Mark chapter 9, verse 32, they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him. Three times. This is what I'm going to do. Jesus, that's not right. Can I just say that I think that's how Jesus is often treated? Just listen to this. Hey, Jesus, I think you've got it wrong. And we mightn't say it publicly. I suspect we say it internally. Hey, Jesus, I think, I think you got this bit wrong. We're just like these men. They're just like us. Jesus is misunderstood. He should have been just an example, a good role model. He should have been a revolutionary. He should have been a great man. He is deluded. What a waste. And the consequences, well, they're immense, aren't they? It's worth actually just remembering what God said when he identified his son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Well, the brothers James and John, I'm at point three. Brothers James and John approach Jesus. They're heading to Jerusalem. We know what's bubbling along inside them, don't we? Uh, They're apprehensive. If you look up there at Mark chapter 10, verse 32, they're astonished. Those following him were afraid. Jesus has said again in a moment, this is what I'm going to go and do. And so these guys come to him with a question. Teacher, we want you to do something for us if we ask you, well, what do you want me to do for you? Well, there it is in verse 37. They answered him, allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. Now, we know what's ticking away inside, don't we? Because I'm just like them. If I'm one of the inner circle, I know what I want to get out of this. Right hand, left hand. It's the pattern. They got the label straight, but they got the content wrong. Jesus immediately confronts them there in verse 38. Jesus said to them, fellas, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptised with the baptism I am to be baptised with? It's the ultimate what would Jesus do moment, isn't it? Because there's only one person who can drink that cup, the cup full of the wrath of God at the sin of humanity. There's only one man who can do that. There's only one man who can undergo a baptism that Jesus describes in Luke 12 verse 50 as a baptism of glory, but it will be of suffering, standing in as a substitute. Jesus had one job, it's to head to Jerusalem, having lived the life he lived of being faithful, 
to head to Jerusalem, to be rejected and to die. And how do, how do they respond to verse 39? And we're able. We've got a bit to learn about following Jesus, don't they? And he confronts them again. Look there in verse 39. Jesus said to them, you, are, you will drink the cup I drink. You will be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left, it's not mine to give. Instead, it is for those it's been prepared for. You will suffer. You will be rejected. You will be persecuted. Gentlemen, you will be killed. You'll follow in my footsteps. You won't do what I have done, but you'll follow me. But notice the humility. Did you notice that there? We saw a little bit of it last week, didn't we? when Jesus was talking about judgment. But notice that there, um, I, I actually can't hand out those places. It's not my job. Jesus has a realistic assessment of where he stands before God. That's not my job. That's God's job. I don't make those decisions. Not even Jesus can grant such a request as a human being. Have you noticed that? Isn't that a remarkable moment of humility? That's God's job. Again, we're confronted by the humility of who Jesus is, coming as a human being, willingly self-limiting himself in the front of blokes who jostle and bray and say, I want a piece of that. Jesus says, that's not my job to give. The other ten disciples, they're just like me. How would you go with this? Hey, they got in ahead of me. That was my request. They were just quicker. And they're indignant. See that there in verse 41? When the other ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus steps in. He calls them together. I'm at point four on the outline. He calls them together. And he speaks to them. Remember Mark 9? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. He speaks to them and he draws a contrast. See there in verse 42, Mark 10, 42. Jesus called them over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and their men of high positions exercise power over them. I think that's a truth that they knew. That's a truth that we know, isn't it? That politics and power in the world can be, can be a brutal self-centred, exploitative business. Well, put yourselves in their shoes, standing on a piece of dirt promised to them by God that they no longer have as their own, with the Romans who've come in, brutally suppressed them, dreams of being crushed, promises are dusty. You imagine them nodding their heads to that, can't you? We know this. It's an exposure of the world set up to run in opposition to God, where each human is God. And Jesus is very clear. What does he say there in verse 43? It must not be like that among you. It must not. Now, what an exposure of the way their minds have been ticking, the way they've jostled as they've walked so they can stand next to Jesus and just go, hey, Jesus, just to make sure they're close because they're getting close to Jerusalem. And look at his contrast there in verse 43. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. In God's mob, the mark of relationship and community is not power, it's not exploitation, it's not self-seeking accumulation. Instead, it's captured in two nouns. Did you see them there? Two nouns. Servant, slave. Servant and slave. At the heart of those is the idea that you work for someone else. In fact, their needs are a priority, the priority. And there's the attribute of humility, a realistic self-assessment of where you stand in the world, especially before God. And notice that Jesus doesn't just command them and then ignore them, does he? 
Because after verse 44 comes verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What a kingdom. What a kingdom. It's crucial, central. The mode of God's kingdom is set by Jesus and he is the slave and servant. And as Jesus speaks that, he actually ties together two ideas that I think they went are contradictory. He immediately attaches himself to Daniel 7. Son of man, the son of man who receives unrivaled power from God to rule the universe as he sees fit who has no competitor, no one who would dare disobey him, and that's Jesus. An imagery that lay behind their expectations that the Romans would be kicked out, but Jesus just listened to a massive new plane, but then he turns it on his head because his coming was not grand. He was born in a stable. He was an apprentice carpenter. He was a man who dined with tax collectors at the margins of society. When he came, it wasn't about his significance, but about the service of others. He gave up his godness expressed this way to express his godness that way by being dressed in the flesh that had the image of the Father. And his service was not simple but costly. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And there's that other reading Lynn brought us, that reading from Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 10 and following, the one who would carry the iniquities of many and die for the sins of people, a death of purpose, a ransom, a payment to set people free. Now, can I just say that I think we are too familiar with this. Too blasé. I don't think we grasp how significant the tying of these concepts together truly is, that the greatness of the Son of Man who has unrivaled power in the universe is connected to the humility of the servant who takes on flesh and is not recognised so that he can do something that we don't deserve but desperately need. The Son of Man has unrivaled authority because he is a slave, because he dies, because he puts the aspirations of prisoners above his own. In fact, their need is his aspiration. It's worth teasing that out a little bit. I'm at point five on the outline. So just work with me very quickly here. To tease that out, we've got to understand what Mark says, that Jesus has actually come as part of God's plan. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who'll prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Jesus came because God had a commitment, an open commitment to deal with our problem of brokenness. Second, Jesus is identified very clearly as God's chosen man for the job. And he makes clear what that job looks like as they walk towards Jerusalem. Rejection, death. At the heart of that is when you tie those two together, God's commitment to deal with our problem, which is sin, and how Jesus deals with it. Jesus has come to deal with my attitude that I'm God and God's not. So he's got to deal with the fact that God judges that with death. And the only way he can do that is if he stands in for us. Remember, he had to be faithful in a way that I never am, always dependent upon God. And because of that, fourth, he can stand in for us. He's exactly like us but perfect. And that's the service. That's the giving up. Remember that phrase from the kids' talk? That's the giving up his life and his death for humans. The one human who is faithful, who resists the devil, stands in for every human who is faithless, taking their judgment from God. 
He gives up for people like us. Fifth, it's not final, is it? And we're going to look at this next week. This is just a teaser. Because every time he talks about what's going to happen to them, he finishes with, on the third day I'll rise again. To show that he's paid for the sins. To show that he's beaten death. And there's the restoration, the good news we talked about. That the punishment for our sin is paid for because this man has the power over all things. Is that good news? It is good news, isn't it? God has done what he promised in the person, the plan, and the purpose of Jesus, the Son of Man who is the servant, to live, die, and rise for the sins of God's people because God had committed to roll back sin and bring blessing. Now, they struggled. I'm at the last point on the outline. We got there. They struggled to understand that, didn't they? Like so many people across history, like many of us today. You know, I'd never seen until this week that connection with Isaiah 53 and Daniel 7 in that verse. I'd struggled to grasp it. We will continue. We will battle against that. It's a progression and God says time and time again, listen to him because the failure to grasp Jesus rightly dwarfs I can say this dwarfs the consequences of Neville Chamberlain. To get Jesus wrong is to have no answer for our sin. To get Jesus wrong is to have no answer for our sin. He came as God's saviour. He came to live the life we could never live to die the death we deserve so that he could rise from the dead, having been faithful and loving so he could bring the good news of restoration. That was his plan. I love that about him. Do you love that about him? Not because he's my example, but because he's my sacrifice, the only sacrifice. Let me be very clear again. To understand him in any other way, is to lose the salvation for our sins. Jesus did this by being the servant who gave up so that our judgment could be paid. Can I tell you, I'm just going to share a little story. I've been praying for weeks for the opportunity to share that with someone. And in, a, in an event that I had no hand in, in an event that started off so differently. This week, God was kind enough to give me that opportunity. Someone actually said to me, so what's a Christian? Have you met Jesus? Can I just encourage you to be praying for those opportunities? We have just spent six weeks looking at various aspects we can share with people and you'll be able to do that this week. Pray for it. But let me close very briefly by picking up one other thing because Jesus is dealing with his own mob at this point, isn't he? And did you notice what he said there in Mark 10 as a way of closing? It must not be like that among you. This mob is fundamentally other person centered, isn't it? Why we do stuff. How we carry our work out as God's mob is not for my fulfilment, not for my value, not for my self-worth. It's so people can see who Jesus is in the way we treat each other, our sacrificial saviour. Isn't that good news? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. This is an amazing little section, uh, like every part of your word is. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the son of man who is the servant of all. Thank you that he lived, died and rose so that we could be restored. Help us not to misunderstand him. Help us to proclaim him and give us those opportunities and help us to display him as we exist as your people. Amen.